law means one thing and then the Indians start to win and then they have to keep changing it. I think you've seen that with the way, you know, the way federal uh, attorneys have handled grand jury proceedings, the way they've handled dissent. Uh, I think there's terrible perversion in a plain, simple English interpretation of the law in the United States today. And that's the thing that worries me more than anything else. If you twist something too long, pretty soon nobody recognizes it. The Indians are going to get screwed. I mean, you got 400 years of doing it. You know, those guys are experienced. I think it's a good thing. I, I, I don't know why he decided to do that, but I think it's a good thing. We've built dams just about every place you can put a dam in the West now. I mean, they've been building dams for 70 years there. What's left to dam? See, what they're really telling about is pork barrel stuff out there. So I, I, you know, I totally support him in cutting off all those dams right straight down the line. That's what they said when they put the first dam in. They put the Coolidge Dam in Arizona and the appropriations specifically said this dam is to provide water to the Gila River Indian Reservation. 20 years later, the Gila Indians never had still not received a drop of water. Being used by Mormon farmers right on up the road there. You can go right down the dam projects that, uh, in the west and find out whether this is specifically to provide water for our Indians and what happened. Somebody taps in for it or it gets the Indians. So don't buy that one. I mean, that one went out with Grover Cleveland. So I think if you really zero in on your American history, you don't have to ask questions like that, even as a member of the press. I mean, you should, you should realize that, you know, they did it in the 1870s, they did it again in the 1880s, they did it in the 1890s, they always use the same excuse. We're almost in the 1980s, right? They're still giving you the same excuse. We're gonna build this dam to help our Indians get water. Well, I think you can, you can take all those issues and put them in one package. We've got a bunch of lunatics running society in the government and in the big corporations. They're going to kill us all. I mean, it's simple as that. You, you can put footnotes and, and go into your favorite field and explore it a little bit. But uh, what are we talking about? You know, five years left in, uh, of gasoline, and Detroit's not going to build smaller cars. They're going to build big cars. We're allocating more water out of the Colorado River than the river has in it, right? You don't, you know, you don't have to look very far to see the insanity in this society. Remember, they came out with a statement: they're going to have to find some way to get sugar price supports because the sugar farmers are going broke. And three days later, they discover saccharin causes cancer. Right? I mean, come on, who are we, who are we kidding here? I heard different reports. I was driving to the West Coast when that happened. And I've been subpoenaed for both those trials to give testimony on the, the condition of chaos that was on those reservations uh, before that incident. And it really had been uh, the chaos that had been on the reservation uh, you know, for 40, 50 years prior to that. I don't think anybody really knows, but I think that the FBI has picked out these three people, Rubidoux, uh, Butler, and Pelletier, and they're, they're going to hang them for something. The two that were who were acquitted down Cedar Rapids are now uh, now on trial for an alleged escape attempt. Well, you know, if you're accused of killing an FBI guy and you got uh, great big six footers running you from prison to prison, uh, you know, nobody in their right mind is going to try an escape attempt. But I think that those three people have been picked as uh, scapegoats, and they're going to be harassed till the government convicts them on something. That's what I say. I think there's a terrible perversion of law going on in the United States today. The federal prosecutor or any prosecutor's duty is to see the justice is done, not to hang people. Yeah, that stuff should have gone out with the vigilantes and Bret Hart and uh, 
black bark. You know, that should have been the end of that stuff. Well, two thirds of domestic coal is under Indian land right now. Uh, but I don't think any any tribes capable of saving themselves at the present time, nor are any whites who own land that has coal. Because nobody can conceive of the scope of operation that's going to take place out there. I think both Indians and, and white ranchers look at the thing in a personal sense, if the coal company doesn't like them. You know, all they can look at is my parents have lived here, my tribes lived here 10,000 years, and my parents have lived here for 140 years, and now this company is doing this bad thing. I think that, that all the people involved with in this take it personally. And if you look at the scope of what's going on, uh, the energy companies are simply going to take all the coal. They're not mad at anybody. You know, it, it's the old American ethic. It's my job, man, you know. Uh, <coughs> and I think they're just going to take all the coal any way they can get it. Uh, you, can, you can do fundraising, you can go to court, you can have all kinds of speeches, political rallies and all that, but uh, in point of fact, you know, the East needs the coal, they're going to come out and take it, away from, you know, take it away from whoever has it. And no right or wrong, it's just you know, absolutely irresistible force over a whole bunch of scattered individuals who happen to be living uh, in a certain place, and that's going to be it. I know it, it builds up into a big emotional issue about Indian versus white and ecologist uh, versus the, the spoiler of the land. But uh, I think the energy company, in fact, Stan Steiner told me the energy companies, at least the Rockefeller interest, had already chartered this out in 1948, that they would need the coal at some future date. <coughs> In Iowa? I don't know, you really have to ask Don Wanity about that. I have uh, not really kept up with uh, the Iowa situation since the summer of 72 when you went around digging up Indian graves uh, to help us preserve our culture. And uh, <coughs> well, people with that short a goal, uh, you know, I don't figure they're going to be up to too much mischief, so I go on to other things. So I really haven't kept track. Don is here, though, and you know he might want to respond to that. Or he was here. There he is. What's the Indian situation now? You can't be buried in, in Sioux City. In, I think he said he had a deed for downtown Des Moines, didn't you? <laughs> but he's waiting for urban renewal to kind of clean it up a little bit. <laughs> Any other questions? Oh. I think you can spread the blame uh, to teachers, school boards, publishers, writers. I think it's a general. What I discovered doing the Wounded Knee research was that almost all the non-Indians writing on the Indian wars were paraphrasing each other. You didn't have to go very deep into the records to find all kinds of new material that you couldn't find in D. Brown or Alvin Josephi or Ralph Andrus or any of these people. They're just a straight paraphrase of each other. And I think when, when those type books, and they're very well written, but, but they're very little research. Uh, 
I, I think a lot of stuff done, in particular with regard to Indian history, is uh, simply clever paraphrasing of what somebody wrote before. You don't have to go very far into any kind of records before you find a whole different story. So I think the blame is uh, really should be shared equally. National Council Church? No, they uh, they went from us to Vietnamese orphans to world hunger to what are they around now? Uh, they're against chrome and Rhodesia or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> I, you know, anthropologists are not the rock bottom of my targets. Uh, <coughs> uh, National Council Church is surely, uh, you know, is, is somewhere in there. I wrote a book for them one time called The Indian Affair. And I handed it in, and, and uh, it was unfortunate for me because the manuscript arrived just after they had a meeting on, on uh, male chauvinist pigs, of which I am uh, one of the <coughs> great representatives in the country. They went through my manuscript, and they said, you've got words like cattlemen and fishermen. They said, that's sexist. And they made me change it to cattle people. <laughs> fisher persons, timber people, and I said, but that's incorrect, that there were cattle men out there. The first group to exploit the plains were Scottish and English corporations who came out and bought large pieces of land, and ran cattle, and hired hundreds of cowboys, and within those sections there were no cow women, and I couldn't breach the point with them. I was thinking calling the book People Fest Destiny to kind of describe this. <laughs> I just I just was out of phase. I just ran right into this new movement. And you know, if if you teach National Council of Churches a new word, then they run berserk for three years. <laughs> and they gotta get this word uh, you should have seen it when they when interface came out. So, and that was followed by infrastructure. And you know, they used to go bananas with this stuff. But uh, God is read. I, I had a manuscript read, read by a Presbyterian theologian, an Episcopalian, and a Roman Catholic. Everything good I said about Christianity, all three claimed it. Everything bad I said, they said it's those other guys that did the bad things. Uh, I'll tell you, my alternate title for God is read was called Up Your Aisle. <laughs> Well, they haven't changed. Well, let me tell you the phenomenon that happened. I, I attacked anthropologists in Playboy. In the next two years, they would sneak up to me and they'd say, I'm really an ethno-historian. I was never an anthropologist. <laughs> <laughs> I've been saying this to the profession all along, but they wouldn't listen to me. So. I'd drive through the desert and there'd be thousands of anthros talking into space saying, we must change, we must change. <laughs> it, it's a useless science, but hardly destructive. I mean, it's, uh, <laughs> See, now I talked to Don Wanity and he said that we ought to put anthropologists in charge of the population explosion and let them teach birth control, because he said if they teach it as, as badly as they teach anthropology, everyone will lose interest. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't say this with anthro on the... <laughs> what? Oh, I don't think they're any worse than... I, I, I really am, am very... No, but I've since extended uh, the scope of my attack to all the rest of the fields of Western knowledge. So. <laughs> <laughs> With the exception of physics and modern art, you know, I don't really see that most of the disciplines doing very much. And what I think anthropology or some social science should do 
in his act as a synthesizing science to bring everything together. And when I don't see him doing that, when I see him out measuring Pueblo ovens or, or doing nonsensical things, uh, they, they kind of, well, I better not say it. <laughs> Yeah, some Indians have done it. I, I should probably have taken the time, but I've been really busy on other things. But I think even the Indians who've tried to get the changes, for the, for the most part, haven't known enough about history uh, to really look to really do a good job on it. It's a tremendous what, what we're really dealing with is a is a tremendous change of viewpoint that that under other circumstances might have taken t uh, thirty or forty years, but all of a sudden people have got to have it done in two or three. And so, you know, we, what we really need is 10 years of, of putting out a lot of Indian scholars who can go in and, and really go through the material and look at it, or seeing a new change of attitude in social science and history, uh, where people will take a, a new realistic look at additional material and come up with uh, new, new ideas and new theory. Is this being done, sponsored by any organization? Not to my knowledge. No, not to my knowledge. That's true, yeah. Yeah, I agree with you 100%, but uh, there just doesn't seem to be much acknowledgement that that's part of the problem. <laughs> to be optimistic? Well, that's where it's difficult, yeah. That's where it's difficult to make a distinction. What I try to be is realistic. See, and, and I, I always run into people like yourself who, who interpret that as either cynicism or pessimism. No, I'm not encouraged about any of this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> No, I'm trying to be realistic. What what encouragement do you see out in the country? Ah, oh, he took fifty dollars away from us the other night, right? <laughs> I mean, come on. <laughs> I think we got to be realistic. You know, we're going to run out of energy. Uh, we're not going to get fundamental change that we need in the government on any kind of level. We're going to sink deeper and deeper into all kinds of mediocrity. And I think the more people who realize that that is the reality facing them and then start to deal with other people who recognize that and, and get some changes, we can make changes. See, I think one of the bad things that, that myself or any other person coming around speaking to colleges can do is to fill you full of some kind of false optimism. I don't think things are getting any better. We've known about the energy crisis for some time. I was on the Board of Hunger and Malnutrition that investigated hunger in America 12 years ago. We haven't made any changes in a fundamental nature to feed the, feed the hungry. So I'm not being pessimistic at all. I'm being as realistic as possible. I'm not saying these are bad people. Yeah, I got nothing against Carter. I don't think he's a crook. What, what I guess fundamentally I would have to say is we have gotten this society so complicated that it may, at this point, be too complicated to straighten out. The whole thing may collapse on us. And we can be sincere as hell, but we've just got it too complicated. All of you should know that from filing your tax forms on Friday, right? <laughs> I mean, that's our, that's our basic problem as I see it. And we've got to untangle the thing. How you do it, I don't know. But let's not delude ourselves that things are getting better. They're not. I mean, we all got to get to work and do something. Uh, you know, to to get the thing moving. The what? I think people all the way, you know, all the way through general attitudes of society. The whole idea of quantity instead of quality. The, the idea of reading anthologies in school rather than reading original works. I mean, the idea that people should pass just because they enroll in a school. I, mean, I don't even like uh, dropping standards for admitting minority students. 
because then you give them a degree that's not worth anything. They're not able to compete in the world they have to live in. They, they become not good attorneys, not good doctors, because they haven't been trained. They've, they've been let off. One thing you all got to recognize is that uh, we didn't have these problems when we were running this country, so it isn't our fault. <laughs> and this is a, something you guys created by yourselves. See? <laughs> I suppose it might, but I'd prefer to see all of that material done at the home community in a spontaneous manner by people who are concerned about preserving their culture and their language. I think the more stuff that can be done spontaneously by small groups and communities, that, uh, that that's, the, that's the only way those things are going to survive. And my friends in uh, Cognawaga and St. Regis, the Mohawks, preserve their language uh, because they're high steel workers. And they get a crew of Mohawks, and they go 40 feet up, and they're swinging girders around. If you don't know how to talk Mohawk, you're in trouble. So everybody learns how to talk Mohawk. I talked to a group of them one time, and they said, we haven't lost a man uh, off our crew for six years. And one of the younger Mohawks said, well, a guy fell just last week. And they said, oh, he was an Italian. We don't count him. <laughs> but uh, I, th I think the preservation of language and culture has got to be something you do yourself. The, the government can't do it for you. Your school board can't do it for you. Uh, you know, and I don't really like to see those programmed out. You become a consumer of your own culture. You lose your identity. You put it out there in a textbook, and then you you get paid, or you or you consume your own culture for two hours a day, five days a week. I, I think that's wrong. What prompted me to go to the theological? I left Iowa State, somewhat of an existentialist. Uh, an excellent pinochle player, and, <coughs> and I, wanted to, I wanted to really go into philosophy and religion. And I went down to the University of Iowa, talked to Gustav Bergman, the great logical positivist, and he said, if you come here and study with us seven years, you will be a logical positivist. And I wanted to be an old-time physician, metaphysician, and uh, yeah, I wanted to kind of be the Indian version of Plato, see, you know. <laughs> <coughs> so the cheapest place to go to get another degree was seminary. You know, and I went there four years. I graduated the year God died, so I figured there was no uh, future in that firm. <laughs> and, uh, <coughs> and I went back to Indians and into Indian politics. It's really funny the the week that they the Time magazine had God is dead theology on its cover. I visited the National Council Church's headquarters in Riverside, and these guys were all changing their offices and moving one floor up. And <clears throat> I said, you don't even wait till the body gets cold, do you? <laughs> I just kind of staggered from, from school to school. And uh, see, I was <clears throat> after, after seminary, then I went into uh, work in Indian politics. And then, then I left there and, be, and became an attorney. And a couple of years ago, I was thinking of going to med school so I could be the only <coughs> doctor, lawyer, Indian chief in the country. <laughs> <coughs> but I did, you know, I just <coughs> was too old by that time. So. Uh, there are no more questions. Oh, well, last question. A lot of it's cultural attitude that, that looks at, at Western technology if, if, as if it were the standard of normality. And when you point out to them, well, these Indians have lived this other way for eight or 10,000 years. And, and if you leave them alone, th that's the way they'd like to live. And they keep saying, well, nobody can live that way because the rest of us don't live that way. And you, and you come across time and again that, that after 40 years of struggling this other way, the government gives up and they do it the Indian way after all. You know, for 50 years, they were going around putting out forest fires. Then they discovered the reason they had those forest fires to clear out the brush and the trees grew better exactly what the Indians did for centuries. And now they're saying, okay, let the forest fires burn because the forest will be better. Well, we get that with the situation with housing. Uh, you know, the Indian adobe is warm in the wintertime, cool in the summertime, costs virtually nothing. 
mean, what are they putting up down there? You know, beaver board things with the studs and everything. Uh, impossible housing for the South there. Impossible. They build impossible housing on Indian reservations. I was working with Turtle Mountain Chippewas when HUD first went into existence. These guys needed $3,000 a piece. They could build themselves log cabins. They're up near the Canadian border, and you need warm log cabins up there. And the government kept insisting you had to have condominiums and you had to have the whole suburban outfit and everything. But it just got to be a disaster. And I think what you, what you really end up getting is people in the federal establishment really can't see. Once they make a decision, they don't want to admit they were wrong. And they really can't see any other alternative. They're always running for office. They always feel they have to produce something. I remember Malcolm Wallop in Wyoming won a Senate seat because with a simple television ad of a man riding off the sunset with a portable toilet on his horse. Because some department of, of uh, the government was interpreting this new act that, that every farm worker had to be within 300 yards of an outhouse. So. <laughs> and if you get three million people working for the government who would look at life that way, you know, there just, there just seemed to be no way to break through. Uh, totally impossible. I evolved the theory that the, the creation was wrong, evolution was wrong, and what probably happened was this planet was the insane asylum of the universe, and every 10,000 years a rocket ship would land on a continent and dump the mentally ill and diseased, <laughs> and, and then they'd flee for the other part of the galaxy. The anthropologist challenged me on that, and I said, I can send you to two places, Washington, D.C., and Los Angeles. And if you can look at that and tell me there's evolution, uh, that things are getting better, I said, you know, I'll buy your theory. But I said, every indication to me is that this is a mentally ill group uh, that we're dealing with. And, and my theory of creation it seems to be more uh, empirically grounded than yours. <laughs> I really don't know. There's, Except I know I can bring their temperature to a boil when I start very slowly to explain we're dependent domestic nations. We have our own culture. We have our own land. We have our own uh, foods. And we'd like to kind of go do that. And then they, they just freak out. They're just Like telling the Episcopalian there is a God, you know? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> it becomes impossible. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate it.